Hello and welcome to another episode of the Illinois Workers Project. I am your host, David Luna, and today is May 14, 2020. Just wanted to start off by saying hello. It's been a while. It's something that I've been really passionate about. I've just been caught up with work and my family and different things going on in my life, so I'm just happy to have the time to be able to focus on something that I, and that I, I really want to pursue in my life, which is this podcast. I hope you guys support it and let me know what you think. So please make sure to give me a thumbs up, comment below, tell me what you think, give me some advice, some insight. If not, let me know um, in a private message. Thank you. So today actually marks one day shy of the 17th week from the very first time that I heard about the coronavirus. That was January 24, 2020. There was a lady that flew in from Wuhan, I believe through O'Hare and ended up right here in St. Alexis Hospital in Hoffman Estates. Uh, she tested positive for COVID-19. And I remember listening to it on CNN and Fox News, on CNBC. It was all over the media. So it was a second known case of the U.S. And this is something that just sparked my interest. I've been keeping up with ever since. I actually looked up the, the CDC website and I remember seeing that there was some sort of press release that encouraged Americans to go out to the grocery store and buy groceries and have a stockpile to last us 14 to 30 days. So that's actually what I did. I remember talking about it with my family and my friends and my coworkers. And some of them thought I was a little bit crazy, even the people at the grocery store, but I didn't care. You know, I went out there and filled her up, brought her home and gave me a sense of security, at least for that moment. There was this press release I remember reading when I came home from work and it, it spoke about up to that point, there had been 835 cases that were reported and confirmed through a laboratory. And out of those 25 had died, the majority of them, 93% were still, was still in the hospital. And a little bit after this lady, her husband that was with her when she came home also ended up testing positive for COVID-19. This was the first human-to-human -human transmission that the media had reported on up to that point. We thought it was just a disease that was spread somehow from a bat to a human, right? Whatever. So around the same time, the White House administration is coming out. They're reassuring the public. They're letting us know that, hey, they're doing everything they can. The CNN actually does a really good job outlining uh, the timeline of February. And they call it the last month. I wouldn't necessarily call it that because there was action being taken. And, excuse me, Donald Trump actually did come out and said, you know, they're going to be screening certain people at the, at the airports. They're not going to allow access from certain countries into the U.S. And they were um, issuing emergency uh, authorization to the CDC to to test for coronavirus and you know they basically Donald Trump basically got out there and said you know we're gonna do what it takes to protect our citizens so up to that point we're doing really good everyone's just kind of blowing it off acting like it's gonna be all right because you know at least that's what we were listening to that's what we were being fed in a sense through the media through some of the the main sources of information that we have so around the same time, also, the Dow Jones hit an all-time high. You know, it was an 11-year bull market. They are 29,551. Yeah, you know, it's an all-time historic record. Never happened before. And just a little bit after that, on um, March 8th or 9th, March 9th, the Dow Jones began to take a dive. It took a 2,000 point dive because the coronavirus started spreading throughout our country. They started talking about quarantine, that it's going to be possibly a pandemic, and they don't know how it's going to affect our country and our economy. People started to panic. 
and started thinking about their 401ks and their pensions and their investments and what they're going to do. And, you know, it got blown out of proportion, but it didn't. N not in the right way, if, if you were to ask me my opinion, you know. So, March 23rd was when the bottom of the market tanked you know it's just the lowest that it got it was 18,321 it's just the lowest point and there was a crisis that never happened it was it was a stock market crash that was prevented it was averted and, and it was by an unprecedented step by the fed their chairman jerome powell came out and they said hey we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that the stock market is okay. We're going to make sure everyone has access to money because they print it. You know, they lend money out to different corporations and that they were going to do whatever it took. They're going to take unprecedented measures to support the financial economy. So I, I do want to talk about what is the Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve was founded by the Federal Reserve Act in December of 1913. It was actually a series of financial panics of 1907. And over the years through the Great Depression, they their responsibilities and their purpose has expanded. It's it's gotten bigger, you know, so they they, they have a lot more power than they did originally. And Wikipedia actually outlines their purpose pretty well. It's they address the problem of banking panics. They serve as a central bank. They strike a balance between private interest of banks and centralized responsibility of government. They supervise and regulate the banking institutions They protect the credit rights of consumers. They manage the nation's money supply through monetary policy to achieve sometimes conflicting goals of max maximum employment stable prices moderate long-term interest. You, you guys get the point right and so the fed came out they are technically a third party they are not they're like an oversight committee they're not directly a part of the government from my understanding but they came out and said hey we're gonna do whatever it takes so you guys don't file, have to file for bankruptcy so man stock market started rally started to pick back up and Last time I checked today, the Dow Jones was at 23,625 and 34 cents. I'm doing okay, you know, definitely picked up. So I started questioning myself, like what happened in that conversation? Like what was said that I didn't understand that made the stock market rally? Like, what is this? What does this, we're gonna do, we're gonna take unprecedented measures to to prop up the economy to make sure you guys don't fail what does that mean right so i started looking in, into that and it just turns out that two days ago the fed began their corporate uh bond buying program so corporate bonds what is a corporate bond so you have corporate stocks which where if you're an investor you buy a stock you're gonna buy like a piece of that company you're gonna buy a stake inside of that company, whereas a bond is more of a loan. They're gonna make sure that they give you, you know, like a certain amount of interest payments on that loan. And by the time it reaches maturity, they're gonna pay back that loan with interest. So that's that's the difference. The Fed said that they are going to invest or spend our taxpayer money, because ultimately that's what it is, buying corporate bonds. I'm like, okay, okay. It doesn't seem too bad as long as they pay back the money. What if they fail? But hey, but then they started talking about they're going to buy buy uh, bonds that, that had junk status, like junk credit ratings. And, and last time I checked, if I were to buy, if I were to want another loan, the prerequisites for me to be able to qualify for that loan have gotten stricter, not 
uh, they haven't like gotten looser you know they they want me to have more capital they want to see like uh, almost to the last minute that i'm employed and i just couldn't believe that they're going to be investing 2.3 trillion dollars to be specific buying back corporate bonds and etfs so go right here so the fed is rescuing everyone right in the aftermath of the coronavirus they are going and they're they actually established uh, a committee of 11 special lending facilities that it's going to distribute these 2.3 trillion dollars in assets right there's 2.3 trillion dollars of money that they're going to print out and there is some concerns with that 2.3 trillion dollars which is 10 percent of our country's gdp 10 percent of our country's gdp 11 of the special lending facilities capable of buying are, are just going to go right to them i'm like okay like these institutions are going to decide who gets the money right and right here table one the structure of federal reserve rescue programs outlines each facility name the asset purchase mechanism, facility size, facility manager, interest rate on the lending, on the loan that they'd give out. So then I started reading further, and right here, it like literally says six of the 11 lending facilities will buy financial assets that are, in general, issued or held by large, sophisticated firms. These firms are not required to do anything to compensate ta taxpayers for credit that without Fed support would be unavailable to them. So I'm like, what? $1 trillion? That's a lot of money. It's going to six of the 11 lending facilities? I'm like, okay, okay. So then we start talking or learning about conflict of interest. The Fed then indicated that the bond buying by the PMCCF and the SMCCF will be executed by BlackRock, which is a financial firm that manages $7 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's a conflict of interest. They're going to be buying corporate bonds. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. BlackRock is in charge of distributing this money to corporations that are going to be selling the Fed, the, the government, taxpayers, in a sense, these corporate junk bonds while they manage seven trillion dollars of these corporate assets that's a huge conflict of interest you know of course it's going to go to you know good old crony capitalism and that's not saying much because just recently with the the new trump administration tax plan that was passed that was supposed to provide a bunch of tax cuts already to the rich of the country my taxes went up. I had to actually pay more this past year than I usually would, you know, which is, it's fine. Okay, I'm doing my part, but it's kind of not fair when you when you hear stories of Elon Musk or other multi-billionaires that pay nothing. Jeff Bezos being another one, you know, it's kind of like, wow, I don't really understand how some of these things might work. So by May 7th, the Fed uh, started reporting that they had expanded their uh, balance sheet by more than $1.5 trillion to that to a total now of $6.7 trillion. So they're allowing corporations to borrow all they need in order to avoid bankruptcy, right? All that's letting me know that inequality in our country is just getting out of control. Out of control. Inequality in our country today is at its highest level in more than half a century. You know, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the richest one-tenth of a percent own between 15 and 20 percent of all our wealth. While the bottom half, bottom half own just one percent. So those are just like bottom half. What does that mean, right? So then I started looking into how many people are in the U.S., 
So 164 million people own just 1% of our country's wealth. I'm like 164 million. That are, it doesn't even sound right. How many people are in Illinois? So I went and looked it up. How many people are in Illinois? Oh, I might have deleted it. So, quick facts: U.S. Census Bureau, so Illinois. Oh, here it is: twelve million six hundred and seventy-one thousand people. So, twelve million people in Illinois, and a hundred and sixty, approximately a hundred and sixty-four million people own just one tenth of a percent. Inequality is getting out of control. This CARES Act is contributing even more to that. We're probably not going to see what the repercussions behind this for like years later. They're going to hide it from us. I'm hoping that, you know, there, there are some pretty good reporters out there that are very well educated. They're going to do their jobs and they're going to put these companies on, in, on blast. I hope that they do, because how do we expect these multi-billion dollar companies that have mismanaged their money to be honest, to make the right decisions when there's, that's another thing. There's, we're supposed to have oversight committees looking over the CARES Act, right? But the inspector general that was in charge of that, he was the acting inspector general. I kind of lost his name, but he was dismissed and the White House administration put one of their own attorneys in place and they are, they're not going to allow them to report anything to Congress. There is no oversight committee. It, it, it's like a free for all, you know. So before this happened, I had been aware of, of something called the corporate debt bubble. You know, I, I listened to a few YouTubers. I go to um, I watched. So I go to Market Watch and I'm and I'm constantly reading like press releases on on things that are a little bit they're they're a little bit beyond my understanding, but I, I at least try to keep up with it and try to keep myself informed so I have an idea of what's going on, right? So before this happened, our economy had been recovering. I talked about February twelfth. You know, we hit an uh, all-time historic high, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So corporate, multi-billion dollar corporate entities were making huge profits. They're, they're, they're rising from the ashes, right? They're recovering from the last recession, the 2008 recession that we had. So then I started thinking about what's going on with all these profits, they started buying their own stocks to artificially inflate their company on the stock market. They would raise the dividends of their shareholders to make them happy. They would raise the bonuses and the salaries of their CEOs. And I'm thinking, wow, if we can't trust a corporation or... Better yet, if we're not allowed to tell a corporation what to do with their profits, why are we bailing them out, right? If they have no social responsibility to the citizens of our country, why should the Fed go out of their way and take an unprecedented step of buying their corporate junk bonds to bail them out when they mismanage their money. It makes no sense to me. It, like, they should be allowed to fail. They, We should see them because they put profits over their workforce. There was no profit sharing programs for their employees, for the majority of them, I, I'm sure. There was no training. They gave bonuses to their corporations, uh, uh, CEOs. They mismanaged their money and now we're bailing them out. I just, I don't see how this is going to help anything out. Like, I really don't. Economists probably know a lot better than me. Reporters, if you guys have any more insight out there that you guys can give me, I'd appreciate it. 
It's a little bit discouraging. I don't know how much of a difference I'll be able to make individually, but I know that if I do my part and at least try to educate or inform the people around me of everything that I'm finding out, that we do have a fighting chance. We got to hold these corporations accountable. We got to oversee what's happening with all these trillions of dollars that, that are being printed by the Fed. We have to do our part and follow up and look at the balance sheets of different corporate entities and make sure that they're not doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. It sounds like a lot of work and it probably is and we're all probably too busy living our own lives, but it does matter. It does matter and we need to start caring because I talk to people every day that either they're coming up positive for COVID-19, they're being laid off, they're being told to, to stay at home, to quarantine, and they're not being paid anything, they're too afraid to speak up for like a $10, $11, $12 job. Like it's crazy. It's crazy like how being poor and a slave to the machine is a mentality that we just can't seem to break, right? It affects so many people around me. It affects my family. It affects my friends, my peers, my coworkers. I'm lucky. I'm, I'm blessed. I, I give all the glory to God that I have good people around me that have been supporting me, that have made sure that Every time that I've fallen, they, they help me get myself back up. And, and I appreciate every single one of them. So while the media is trying to put all these reports of, you know, the disproportionate rate that Latinos are being impacted by COVID-19, not taken away from it because I actually looked into it. And it's, it's somewhat true, I mean, because there's a lot of people that are not putting their ethnic backgrounds. Um, and the disproportionate amount of, like, black people that are dying from this. So, there's a friend of mine that is always encouraging me to not victimize myself. Like, I acknowledge the, rea the harsh realities of, of, of a situation, but I don't give those ideals power, whether it's hatred or or the media talking about a marginalized community by allowing those ideals to affect me, you know? So I start looking more at the bigger picture. Like, why should I be thinking about everything that makes me different from the people that, that live around me? Like, I'm more focused on everything we have in common the things that are relatable and almost everyone that I know almost is blue collar working class Americans. Doesn't matter what skin color they are, whether they're documented or not. We work really hard and we work shoulder to shoulder. We're on the front lines and a lot of these companies, they, dictate so much in our lives, you know? So to what point do we allow the division of these politics to keep us pitted against one another? To what point do we allow the hatred to continue to, to divide so many of us that are just Americans, like we are, and God bless America, we are Americans, man. And, and I feel like we kind of lost that spirit a little bit. There's so much that we're paying attention or being distracted with that we're really not giving energy to the things that are affecting us, whether it's local politics in those elections or realizing that the Fed is bailing, on, bailing out Wall Street again while the taxpayers are ultimately being left to shoulder that burden. And that's a huge injustice in my book. I'm not sure, again, what I can do, but I'm sure as hell going to try to make and, and do my part, you know? And I hope you guys do as well.
Again, this is another episode of the Illinois Workers Project. If there's something that I missed, something that I, I overlooked, please feel free to comment below, like my video, and, and thank you all once again.